that's been accused of stoking white nationalism and anti-Semitism. President-elect Trump has named him his chief strategist. Bannon also led Trump's campaign and devised the strategy to defeat Hillary Clinton. Bannon figured out a way to kind of hack into the mainstream media and propagate these negative anti-Clinton stories. We talked with journalist Joshua Green, who profiled Bannon in Bloomberg Businessweek. He revels in this image of himself as an outsider who is giving a big middle finger to the system. Perhaps the most controversial move Donald Trump has made since winning the election is the appointment of his campaign chair, Steve Bannon, as chief strategist and senior counselor for the president. Donald Trump elevating Steve Bannon to chief strategist and senior counselor in the White House. Already, multiple hate watch groups are now rebuking the appointment, voicing their concerns about Bannon's ties to the alt-right. Bannon was brought on as CEO of the Trump campaign in August. He came in as the head of the right-wing website Breitbart News with a nationalist populist reputation. Known for controversial headlines like Bill Kristol, Republican spoiler, renegade Jew, and birth control makes women unattractive and crazy. What we need to do is bitch slap the Republican Party and get those guys, you know, heaving too. And, and, and if we have to, we'll take it over. Bannon's longtime mission to take down the establishment wing of the Republican Party. If you're fighting to take this country back, it's, you know, it's not going to be sunshine patriots. It's going to be people who want to fight. I mean, Andrew Breitbart was all about the fight. In fact, we call ourselves internally the fight club. And Bannon's target number one has been House Speaker Paul Ryan. Emails obtained by the Hill newspaper show Bannon giving orders to his staff to try to take him down saying the long game is to have Ryan gone by spring. Bannon, a former Navy officer and Goldman Sachs banker, also surrounded by controversy in his private life. In 2007, his ex-wife accused him of domestic violence and making anti-Semitic remarks, saying in court he doesn't like Jews and that he doesn't like they raise their kids to be whiny brats and that he didn't want the girls going to school with Jews. But Bannon's camp says he never said it. I pledge to every citizen of our land that I will be president for all Americans. Now with this Bannon so in the White House, critics questioning Trump's inclusive vision. A New York Times editorial condemned Bannon's appointment, and the Southern Poverty Law Center is circulating a petition urging Trump to rescind the pick. The center has called Breitbart News a white ethno-nationalist propaganda mill. Bannon has described Breitbart News as a platform for the alt-right, but he disputes the charge that he or the website embraces racism or anti-Semitism. To learn more about Bannon, we're going to hear from Joshua Green of Bloomberg Businessweek, who wrote a lengthy profile of him last year before Bannon joined the Trump campaign. Green is the magazine's senior national correspondent and a weekly columnist for the Boston Globe. He spoke with Fresh Air's Dave Davies. Some of his money comes from Seinfeld royalties. Is this right? This is true, yes. I mean, he told me that uh, you know, one of his most memorable deals was between Ted Turner and Castle Rock Pictures, which I believe owned the rights to the Seinfeld show, which at the time was only in like its first or its second season and was far from a hit. Turner wound up a bit short of cash when it tam- came time to come to the table. And uh, rather than let the deal fall apart, Bannon agreed to take residuals from a basket of TV shows uh, that included Seinfeld in lieu of his full fee. And the way he described it to me, he, he, he said that Seinfeld was the runt of the litter, that there were other shows that were more popular and seemed like they would pay off more down the line. But as we all know now, Seinfeld became an enormous hit. Uh, and so, so he's had a steady stream of income from that ever since. Because he was in the entertainment end of the financial industry, he ended up making movies. He made a documentary, uh, I guess, about Reagan uh, called In the Face of Evil. Uh, This was around the time he connected with Andrew Breitbart. Uh, Tell us who he was and how they got together. Well, Andrew Breitbart was a conservative provocateur, I guess is the best way to put it. But he's someone who lived out in Hollywood. He worked for Matt Drudge, uh, who runs the Drudge Report website. So he's someone who has a deep, deep understanding of kind of how the culture processes political news and how to shape news narratives by focusing people's attention on certain stories or certain storylines. 
Uh, Breitbart was an interesting guy because he lived and circulated in Hollywood, which, as we know, tends to be a bastion of liberalism. But here he was, a conservative, rubbing elbows with people like Ariana Huffington, a lot of other folks. Breitbart delighted in kind of, uh, you know, provoking and outraging those liberals, really derived a lot of joy, I think, from being the skunk at the garden party. Bannon himself was living out in L.A. at the time. Uh, had had become really smitten with Ronald Reagan after his time in the Navy. Uh, he read a book by a conservative author named Peter Schweitzer called Reagan's War and decided, you know, he had the money. He thought he understood the entertainment industry, and he made a documentary called Reagan's War about Schweitzer's book. And it was at the premiere of that movie in 2004, uh, Bannon describes it, that Breitbart essentially came storming out of the audience and gave him a big bear hug uh, in a speech about how guys like them had to take back the culture. And basically, Breitbart, I think, conscripted Bannon into what was then, uh, it, it was it was pre-Tea Party, but it was that kind of uh, Republican populist view that we have to kind of rise up and take back our government and take back our culture. And Bannon obviously uh, heard a lot in that that he liked. Uh, and so he he wound up becoming a, a financial backer and then ultimately the executive chairman uh, of Breitbart News after Andrew Breitbart died. I had forgotten this, but it was Breitbart News that broke the Anthony Weiner texting scandal originally. It was, yes. And that, that was a classic Breitbart kind of story in that it took someone who was a, a liberal culture warrior all over TV, you know, loudly condemning Republicans uh, and essentially exposed him as a hypocrite in the most embarrassing and humiliating sort of way. And if you remember back to that scandal, you know, initially Wiener denied it, and then he said he'd been hacked, and then there was just this bizarre, surreal scene where Wiener was getting ready to have a press conference, and all of the New York media had assembled around this empty podium, and then out from backstage comes not Anthony Wiener, but Andrew Breitbart himself, who hijacked the press conference and the microphone and began taking questions from astonished reporters. That was a classic Breitbart kind of move, just creating a a, a media firestorm and then kind of gleefully egging it on. And ultimately, you know, that took down Anthony Weiner. Andrew Breitbart died in 2012 suddenly, and Bannon became executive chairman of Breitbart News. Uh, Was his approach any different from, from Andrew Breitbart? The way that Bannon describes it, there is a a clear continuation uh, from Matt Drudge to Andrew Breitbart to Breitbart News as it exists under Bannon and Larry Solov, who is the CEO. What what Bannon told me, I went back and, and pulled some notes from my interview at the time. He said, Breitbart is almost like a medieval guild where you're passing on that special knowledge. You know, we learned it from Andrew, who learned it from Drudge. We are going to carry on the banner and keep doing what Andrew wanted us to do. So that is sort of the 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 view or the conceit that folks at Breitbart News have, this idea that they're kind of carrying on Breitbart's war against the culture. And that's very much what Bannon seemed to think he was doing over the last few years. In 2012, when Steve Bannon was the executive editor of Breitbart, he established a research arm, the Government Accountability Institute. What does it do? Well, Bannon, what, what, what attracted me to Bannon originally was that, you know, if you look at kind of the infrastructure, the organizational chart of the Republican right wing, what Hillary Clinton once referred to as the vast right wing conspiracy, uh, what you see is that a lot of the tendrils lead back to Steve Bannon. So uh, not only was Bannon executive chairman of Breitbart News, but then with some of the same financial backers, he started the Government Accountability Institute, which is a nonprofit research organization based in Tallahassee. Uh, And whereas Breitbart is uh, gleefully provocative uh, and hard right, uh, the conceit at GAI is that this is a research organization that is going to do Uh, digging and stick to the realm of facts, and they're going to investigate corruption and cronyism in government, be it Republican or Democrat. Um, GAI was was a pretty sleepy shop, uh, but what really brought GAI into the forefront was that GAI's president, Peter Schweitzer, 
uh, wrote the book Clinton Cash that became an unexpected bestseller back in the spring of 2015, just as Hillary Clinton was getting ready to launch her presidential campaign. Uh, it, it drove up her unfavorability ratings, and it raised uh, all sorts of pernicious questions about uh, who Clinton and the Clinton Foundation had financial relationships with uh, and whether or not this was going to be a problem in her presidential campaign. It was clear, I think, from the, the scope and tenor of the coverage that there was really something there. And that is the other way, I think, in which Bannon has been able to hack mainstream media news coverage, uh, because these Clinton cash stories and the various relationships that the book documented were intentionally not published on right wing sites like Breitbart News. Uh, What GAI did instead was to reach out to investigative reporters in mainstream media outlets like The New York Times, uh, The Washington Post and others, and try and encourage their reporters to take this research that they'd done and to go off and do some digging on their own. And they did, and that wound up um, resulting in front-page stories in a lot of major newspapers that got this negative information about Clinton in front of a whole different audience than reads Breitbart News or listens to talk radio. Okay, so this book, Peter, was written by a conservative scholar and former advisor to Sarah Palin. So will the allegations in this book have legs? Well, uh, what what you heard from Hillary Clinton there yesterday was interesting because, remember, Carol, she is the one who termed the phrase vast right-wing conspiracy. The the Clintons, uh, for years and years and years, have worked to fend off uh, attacks from the right and also characterize legitimate criticisms from Republicans as, uh, you know, fringe attacks. Uh, That's what they're going to try to do with this book. However, as you point out, Peter Schweitzer, the author of Clinton Cash, uh, you know, he is a conservative scholar, went to Oxford, recently partnered with 60 Minutes, uh, you know, on a a story about insider trading in Congress, uh, partnering with The New York Times uh, and other organizations with this book, which lends a veneer of credibility to it. And Jeff, there are signs that the Clinton campaign is worried about this book because the Clinton Foundation put out a statement. Didn't you call them for a statement? That's right. The campaign put out a statement. But even more than that, we saw the secretary herself, the former secretary of state, um, addressing this. So this is what one advisor referred to me as a fire that we need to put out. This is the first time the Clinton campaign has responded as aggressively across the board. Um, um, In an interview last night with uh, the top Democrat on their campaign, John Podesta, through surrogates um, all day long, this is the first test of the Clinton response. Um, and they don't necessarily believe, and they say there's not any a smoking gun in the book, but they are worried about just the whole discussion of trust and credibility. So this is the first example of something that they are trying to push back on aggressively. Um, so we'll see if that works. Joining us now is a combatant on the other side of that fight. David Brock is the founder of the liberal group Media Matters and also founder of American Bridge, a liberal pact that has conducted a considerable amount of oppo research on 2016 Republican presidential hopefuls. Uh, Mr. Brock's group has put out a whole dossier today uh, on Peter Schweizer, the author of this Clinton book and Mr. Schweizer's history of getting things wrong. David Brock, thanks for joining us this evening. Thanks for having me on. So um, it is not unusual for campaigns or for partisans who support or oppose specific campaigns to try to shop oppo research to media organizations to try to get them cover it as news. Do you think there is something different about what Peter Schweizer has done with this Clinton book? Well, I don't know if it's different, but I would say it's disappointing that the New York Times is chasing the same story as Fox News. I think what we have here that might be unique is a convergence of millions of dollars being spent by Republicans on opposition research and a press corps that's so competitive uh, on the Clinton beat that they're looking for any anti-Clinton crumb. And what happens in the situation, which may be happening here, is that, you know, I have no problem with the Times vetting books. I've written books. That's not really unusual, but I think they didn't set the bar are particularly high here because this author has a rap sheet, as you have already set up, as long as my arm. And we did, we looked at, a, we did a 7,000 word report for Media Matters today. We found 10 instances of really seriously botched journalism, retractions, corrections, uh, media getting burned by picking up this material. And these weren't our words, but people saying sources that don't exist and facts that don't check out and not meeting the standards of journalism uh, 101. And so I think you have 
have the journalis journalistic story, and then uh, and then you have the political story uh, that you've covered, which is to say that this is much more of a coordinated political attack than it is a typical book tour. And if you look at how Donald Trump chose to run against Clinton in the general election, Trump was essentially channeling the same attacks that Bannon had conceived and pushed in the Clinton cash book. And so, and so, and so, and, you know, and so ultimately, you know, he succeeded in this years long plan to plot and carry off the downfall of, of, of Hillary Clinton. You know, there's a lot of um, consternation, criticism, alarm about the appointment of Bannon to a senior level position in the Trump White House. The concern is that it suggests a tolerance, if not embrace of racism and anti-Semitism. I mean, I've also never seen the hate and the racism out of so many people who are saying, we're no going to agree to... There's no racism. You, you don't think Breitbart News, Stephen Bannon, Breitbart the architect... News not running for office. But, but Stephen Trump. Bannon is the architect of Donald Trump's Donald campaign Trump right now. Running, what do you believe Breitbart Nobody runs represents? Donald Trump's campaign, but Then what do you Trump. call the CEO and, and, of his and campaign? And for all this stuff you're throwing around, racist? The last thing in the world Donald Trump is is a racist. I know him for 28 years. And, of course, Steve Bannon, the former head of Breitbart, now running Trump's campaign. Is this a conservative media takeover of the Trump campaign and of debate prep? Well, I think you have to separate Steve Bannon from Breitbart from conservative media. I mean, Breitbart is, hmm. is you know, they're, they're in the hate business. They're a bunch of nuts. Um, and, you, and you, I think say, that, you say the hate business. That is very strong language. Well, read Breitbart. That's what they are. You know, this is whole alt-right thing, which I... I think it's just repackaged racism, trying to put a better name on it, uh, and xenophobia. And to be clear, you are a Republican strategist. You ran Romney's campaign four mm -hmm. years ago, and you're sitting here saying that one of the most popular websites for Republican readers is a, is a hate machine? Yeah. I mean, What does read that say it. about the party? Well, I, I, listen, I don't think much about what Trump's nomination says anything good about the party. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we lost 2012. Uh, we went through the so-called autopsy, which, you know, I think Reince Priebus deserves a lot of credit for doing that. The path forward is clear. Republicans have to appeal to a larger section of the country, which means non-white voters. You can debate whether or not there's a moral obligation. I would argue there is. But you can't really debate that there's a political uh, mandate. What about the idea that Breitbart News itself propagates, you know, white supremacist views? I mean, the... Uh the New York Times editorial on this said to scroll through Breitbart's headlines is to come upon a parallel universe where black people do nothing but commit crimes, immigrants rape native-born daughters, and feminists want to castrate men. Southern Poverty Law Center says he made Breitbart News a white ethno-nationalist propaganda mill. What's your sense of the content of Breitbart News? Well, it is certainly uh, inflammatory and fixated on race, on religion, on all the sorts of things that have upset people. Uh, I think the thing to understand about Breitbart, uh, and this is not to excuse anything they write or publish, is that they are deliberately provocative. They're aiming to offend and upset people uh, in order to stoke the grassroots anger at government and the broader culture. In internet language, it's, it's, it's an elaborate and effective trolling operation um, because that is what marshals this group of disaffected uh, Republicans, uh, you know, and in, in, in other people, sometimes referred to as the alt right, uh, but essentially this splinter faction of conservatives who have attacked and now taken over the Republican Party over the last four or five years. You know, it's one thing if white supremacists read Breitbart News and, and, <clears throat> and, and if they write shocking comments in response to the stories. But as <clears throat> you look at the content, I mean, does, does the website seem to, you know, embrace and propagate these views of, of white nationalism and white supremacism? What's your I think I think it certainly fuels those views. And, you know, I had a discussion with with Bannon about this back in 2015 uh, about, you know, you know, I said, you know, you're a, a former Harvard guy. You're a Goldman Sachs banker. I'm sort of shocked at some of the things you write because you come out of a, a out of a culture that isn't, you know, openly racist or anti-Semitic. And what he said essentially was that. They are trying to reach an audience that doesn't have an outlet anywhere else in mainstream media. I, I pulled up some of the quotes. He said, you know, we focus on things like immigration, ISIS, 
race riots, what he calls the persecution of Christians. He says, we give a perspective that other outlets are not going to give. There are not a lot of outlets that are covering that, at least not from the perspective that uh, we should be running a victory lap every time some sort of traditional value gets undercut. The question I was always interested in getting at with Bannon was, do you really believe this stuff? Because a lot of it is offensive and inflammatory. And he said, you know, personally, I'm, 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 I'm mixed on a lot of this stuff. Uh, But we're airing a lot of things that traditional people are thinking that don't get mainstream media representation anymore. So they were making a market for these kinds of views and these kinds of stories and attracting uh, an audience, what's turned out to be an extremely large and powerful audience, by tapping these sentiments. I'm wondering what Bannon brought to the campaign. It seems like his real expertise is in messaging. Was was he primarily a guy who brought that expertise? I think messaging and theater, uh, for for lack of a better word. I mean, Bannon is a guy who who came out of uh, the media world. He used to be a movie producer. He made documentary movies. Uh, He's somebody, I think, with a pretty clear sense of narrative and also of the value of presentation and how you can seize the attention of, of the entire political culture if you push the buttons right. I think he's figured out that you can essentially seize uh, control of the political conversation through stunts like the one that Bannon orchestrated before the second debate, where he rolled out all these women who had accused Bill Clinton of sexual assault and sexual harassment. And he's somebody, I think, who takes Trump's impulses and channels them into a more or less cogent worldview that fits into this right-wing populist ethos that Bannon is all about. You know, what's interesting about it is that if Bannon was good at pushing Trump in directions of appealing to this provocative populist message, it's in the closing days of the campaign when Trump was muted and on message and not making headlines that he really made progress in the polls. It's kind of an irony, isn't it? No, I I actually wouldn't agree with that. I think in the closing days of the campaign, if you listen to what Trump was saying, I mean, it was unhinged. I mean, this stuff about dark conspiracy theories and uh, cabals of global bankers, it struck tones, I think, that were anti-Semitic. I would argue that Trump in the final weeks of the campaign was – you know, mainlining the purest distillation of, of, of Bannon's views out there on the stump. It's a global power structure that is responsible for the economic decisions that have robbed our working class, stripped our country of its wealth, and put that money into the pockets of a handful of large corporations and political entities. The Clinton machine is at the center of this power structure. We've seen this firsthand in the WikiLeaks documents in which Hillary Clinton meets in secret with international banks to plot the destruction of U.S. sovereignty in order to enrich these global financial powers, her special interest friends, and her donors. The corporate media in our country is no longer involved in journalism. They're a political Special interest, no different than any lobbyist or other financial entity with a total political agenda. And the agenda is not for you, it's for themselves. And their agenda is to elect crooked Hillary Clinton at any cost, at any price, no matter how many lives they destroy. And that, to my shock and a lot of other people's, that actually resonated with a much larger segment of the electorate than we had anticipated. He's an interesting character. And, you know, in your profile of him, the photos show him wearing cutoffs. And when you see him in photos now, like with the transition team, he really stands out from the Trump family who are so carefully, you know, tailored and coiffed. I mean, Bannon... You know, he looks a little unkempt. He might have a little growth of beard. He doesn't have a tie. His hair isn't exactly combed. I mean, you know, if one were being unkind, he'd look, you might say he looks like somebody ready to mix it up. You spent time with him. Is this huh. is this a cultivated look or is that just him? That is just – I mean, I mean, if you want to be blunt, he looks like a bloated 
homeless alcoholic <laughs> and, and, and revels in that view. I mean, if you look at the cover picture he let us shoot for Business Week, he is uh, sitting in a couch wearing like two polo shirts on top of each other with an Oxford shirt over that and cargo shorts and flip flops. Clearly hasn't shaved or showered. He revels in this image of himself as an outsider who is, is uh, giving a big middle finger to the system. There are petitions circulating urging Trump to reverse the hiring of Steve Bannon. Um, why is he so loyal to Steve Bannon? There's been so much kind of shock and consternation about how a guy like Bannon, um, who, who is so far outside the bounds of anybody who typically be considered for a, you know, a West Wing position, gets elevated to one. I think it's important to remember what we've just witnessed and what Trump himself has just seen. That Bannon, and this is what originally attracted me to him as a profile subject, is a smart guy and a clever strategist who orchestrated this elaborate plan to deny Hillary Clinton the presidency that we've just watched work. It succeeded. And so I think that Trump has a degree of faith in Bannon that he doesn't have in other people. And I think that's why Trump has been willing to withstand all the intense criticism over the Bannon appointment that we've seen in the last few days. To me, it's sort of like the least shocking aspect of, of what Trump has done in appointing Bannon to the West Wing. I mean, the guy hatched this elaborate plan to stop Clinton, and it worked. The plan being to research her background as a well, the, 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 the State the, Department and put out the book and feed it to the <clears throat> mainstream media. Yeah, well, the, the, the plan being, you know, the, this multi-year, multifaceted effort to take down Hillary Clinton, right? Part of it was Breitbart News with its rolling narratives about how Clinton was corrupt and doing Benghazi and this and that and really stoking all this conservative right-wing anger against her and against any Republican that treated her as anything less than, uh, you know, a terrible pariah and a threat to the country. That eventually came to include people like Paul Ryan, who are the most mainstream of Republicans. And then on the other hand, you have the Government Accountability Institute and the Clinton Cash book that figured out a way to kind of hack into the mainstream media and propagate these negative anti-Clinton stories that had the effect of driving up her unfavorability ratings. If you look at what happened in the election, essentially Clinton was too unpopular.